All right. Good morning, everyone. It is April 23rd, and this is uh, your Senate Health and Welfare Committee. Today, we're going to be going through some bills, uh, hopefully to get to closure and be able to vote on um, all of the bills that we have before us today. Uh, so, and before we do that, uh, I thought it would be a good idea just to share with you that our committee has been chosen to uh, begin using captioning for the audience. So when we're speaking and we'll try to articulate as carefully as we can, um, the captions will be, will scroll with the Zoom, with the YouTube, with the Zoom and with the YouTube. So we'll be able to see what we're saying and folks out in the Zoom world will also be able to see what we're saying. So that that's just a heads up. And just remember, I think for all of us that when captions are captured with an with what we're saying, they are not always accurate, but we'll hopefully they will be. So thank you all for your understanding as we go forward. So this morning we have Jen Carby. Uh, Jen, we're continuing work on some of the bills. Uh, we, we decided today to start out with H104. So why don't we look at that together and then we can decide how to proceed. Great, so did you want to look at the uh, amendment or did you wanna look at the, cause it's not a straight, it's just a little one line. Do you want a reminder of what the bill is? And yes, then we- Yes, please, okay. yes. Let me yes. just pull up the bill. Um, that came over to you. I think that will be helpful. You know, and we also have the amendment on our iPad, so we could pull the, um, the amendment up on our iPad while we're going through the bill. It's not a big sure, amendment. It's a, no, it's a very short amendment. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so for the record, Jennifer Carby, Legislative Council. Um, this is H-104 as it came over to you from the House. This is the act relating to considerations in facilitating the interstate practice of healthcare professionals using telehealth. And it creates the working group that would look at different ways for um, facilitating the practice of healthcare professionals throughout the US using telehealth the number of members and the amendment would add in a, as a new number five, the commissioner of mental health or designee. Um, the working group is directed to compile and evaluate these methods, including, so some of the options they'll be looking at would be creation of telehealth licenses, waiver of licensure, national licensure compacts, and regional reciprocity agreements. And then directs them to consider certain issues when they're evaluating the potential options for use in Vermont. And uh, OPR is leading and, um, and assisting the working group. The report is due by December 15th. And that's about it. Okay, can we scroll back up to the working group, please? Yes, the members. Yes, the members, right, just to, to go through and to take one last look at who's involved. Yes, so we have the director of OPR, representatives of the healthcare professions associated with OPR that would be selected by their respective licensing board or by the director, the executive director of the Board of Medical Practice, representatives of the healthcare professions licensed by the Board of Medical Practice, selected by the commissioner of health then the amendment would add in here a new number five, the commissioner of mental health or designee, then representatives of healthcare professional organizations, representatives of health insurers and other interested stakeholders. Okay, that, that looks pretty comprehensive. Committee questions for Jen. I guess, I guess you could take it down unless okay. someone, okay. Questions on the bill? Questions on the proposed amendment? And so if you want, I can just put that up if you want as well. Uh, so I we don't know. 
committee, do you want to look at it? Well, I would like you to have at least seen it. Okay. Yeah, I'm I'm looking at it on, on my sure. iPad. Okay. But I don't know. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the lead in language is much longer than the actual edition. This would insert a new subdivision in subsection five. Uh, subsection B, that would be subdivision five to say the commissioner of mental health or designee, and then we'd renumber the rest of the subdivisions. Okay, that works. Committee, questions, comments? Okay, very good. So I guess I would entertain a motion on H104 as amended by uh, draft 1.1. Right, I think you need to to vote on the amendment and then the bill as amended. Okay. Okay, so, yeah, we've done it both ways, but this okay. that's fine. Go ahead. Go ahead, Senator Hooker. So moved to um, accept the amendment <laughs> as drafted in uh, draft 1.1. Okay, there's a motion to accept the amendment. Any discussion? All right, Mr. Clerk. All right, thank you. I'll call the uh, roll at this time. I'll start with myself. Uh, I'm a yes. Uh, Senator Hooker? Yes. Senator Cummings? Yes. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lyons? Yes. Okay, I have a vote of 5 to zero, 0 to advance H-104. So, I, I am watching the um, transcript. The, uh, yeah, the <laughs> captioning and uh, Senator Lyons, you growl and have a mane. And <laughs> Senator is, sen is center. <laughs> and I believe Senator Hooker was U.S. Senator Booker for a minute there. Yes. I'm not sure if that correct. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a vote of 500. <laughs> oh no this is fun. you can oh, turn it off. off you know there is a way to to not see it because i don't see it i just turned off you, the live. you've got a little you have something on your uh, on your bar below that says live transcript you can click it on yeah. or off. Ah, okay yeah. I have you don't have to off. see it because it's probably distracting distracting yeah it, it is and three it days part to of the... turn it off on my on the tv my husband is known for just pushing buttons and suddenly we had subtitles. <laughs> awesome. Okay, so I'm looking for a reporter for H104. And who is up for this? I think it is probably either Senator Terenzini or Se Senator Cummings. Is there a volunteer? <laughs> Come on, Josh, this is an easy one. <laughs> okay, it sounds like my sounds like it's my turn. <laughs> I think I think it you'll do a, a terrific job and you know I think this is really a, a a huge step forward for us in terms of understanding um telehealth. So when uh, when in your expert opinion, Senator Lyons, when would you think that this would be reported out? If you get it up to the secretary today, it will be on notice on Tuesday, and then you would report it on Wednesday, okay. all things being equal. Okay. Does that work with your schedule? I, I believe it that should, so. Okay, all right, terrific. All so right, I think that's... because you followed my direction and took the vote on the amendment, you still have to now vote on the bill as amended. Oh, Senator, I mean, uh, Ledge Council. <laughs> I Counselor. A motion now <laughs> on the bill. So Senator Terenzini is reporting the amendment. Now let's see what we can do with the bill. Senator Hooker. I move that we pass H-104 um, as amended by the committee. Okay. Discussion? All right, Mr. Clerk, Senator Clerk. Okay, uh, myself, yes. Senator Hooker? Yes. Senator Cummings? Yes. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lyons? Yes. Vote of 5-0-0. Zero, zero. So, Senator Terenzini, um, you can take the 
send the amendment, got a clean copy of the bill from Jen and a clean copy of the amendment from Jen. And then that all goes up to the secretary's office by email with the vote and your name as reporter. Okay. You're all set. Excellent. That was a hard one. Okay, let's uh, keep going. Jen, we have 120 that we've been working on for a while. Yes, that's right. So why don't we look at that? All right, let me together. just pull that one up and I will put it up. Okay. Uh, so he was making, a, I think, a few changes as we were talking yesterday. And perhaps I will do the same thing because I think that's fairly productive. Um, so you had changed the name to the Commission on Affordable Accessible Healthcare. So I had made that change. Um, uh, let's just, uh, committee, if you have. Uh, if you want to stop anywhere, please do that. We'll have a, a fuller discussion after we've been through the bill once, but just if if you think you see something that absolutely needs some change or you want to add, um, and then we'll go back to it afterwards. So Jen, I do have a question. <laughs> Is there a difference between a committee and a commission like anywhere like statutorily or Whatever. No, I don't think so. I mean, I, you know, a lot of it is just how we sort of choose to name them. I tend to think of a commission as being something sort of um, reasonably long, uh, of longer duration than a committee or a working group or a task force. Um, but I, you know, if you want to call it a commission, you can call it a commission. Let's, let, let's hold that one. I'm, I'm writing that one down. And we'll come back for that to that for discussion. I, I'm agnostic on it. I think it is a committee. It's, it could be a working group. Uh, commission just gives it a little more, I don't know, appearance of standing, I guess. Okay. All right. Um, so do you want me to just flag for you right now that the things that are yeah. different from when we went through it the last time? All right. Um, so I think we had looked at this new finding and, and you'd asked for a small change to it. So it now it says the ever increasing cost of prescription drugs continues to significantly increase the cost of health insurance and limit individuals ability to access care. And you had me add and treatment. So that's the change here. Oh, wait, Jen, sorry. Yes. Um, back on number two, which there aren't changes on at the moment, but we had gotten an email, I think you were on it, about how this these numbers have changed with the new subsidies um, now that there are the federal subsidies for sing, for individuals. And I I don't know I, if we want to change those numbers based on the well, subsidies or not. If they're updated numbers and we they're they're validated, I I I do know the person who sent them to us, so that might be something we could update, but yeah, and you may want to think about how you want to approach it. I'm not sure it makes your point as compellingly with the new numbers. And so right. maybe instead of saying currently, we could say prior to the American Rescue Plan Act or something like that so that it's... We could say can, in 2020. Right. Let's do that. Okay. Okay. So I'm... Highlighting that. All right. Thank you, Senator Hardy, for flagging that. Um, all right. And then we have, again, the Wait, um, name, Jen, which we'll revisit. Yes. Before we get off the findings, um, we had, like, can we connect this to current law, to Act 48? in any way, um, put a finding in there that just says, you know, we're hoping to um, make sh be sure, ensure that the policies, the principles of Act 48 are um, considered. 
when looking at I guess if you're going to put Act 48 in, then you'd have to put in all statutory, you know, statutory reform efforts that are, that are in place. So Is that... uh, it's, that's different from Act 48. We've taken steps since think... Act 48. Oh, sorry to interrupt, Madam Chair. No, go ahead. I'm looking at Jen first, and then I will... Well, right. So I think there are um, there are a number of, of principles for healthcare reform that were adopted in Act 48 and codified as well. So they're actually in Act 48 twice because they got it um, incorporated into the Green Mountain Care Board chapter as principles for healthcare reform. So I, I certainly think you could, you know, um, restate your commitment to the principles adopted in Act 48 or or um, incorporate them in in some way if you want. I think that that idea of adopting the principles has become kind of a touchstone for some people in the area of healthcare reform. So I, you know, it certainly still, um, still valid law still has a lot of, of words and phrases that we could pull from um, to reiterate in here if that's something the committee wanted. Yeah, I was gonna say, I don't know if it's in the findings or in the, their, um, the creation or duties or whatever, but some kind of cross references do exactly that. The principles of healthcare reform, which is, I think, 18 BSA 9371. You probably have that. That's memory. right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, it I, up, was, I was actually going to suggest that that might be the more appropriate place for it. Uh, so let's let, keep, hold that thought okay. and um, we'll go from the findings and scroll and then scroll down to the what the right so this is the the powers and duties um yeah. i'm and i don't know if you'd put that in in the lead in language or what they're considering or maybe something to keep that in in um sort of the focus through which they are looking at these specifics uh, yeah so i'm looking at number five which has been added so when we get the green right yeah. okay yep the green Yes. Number, All right. Number five. So, you, you're going. Yeah, I know. I, I know. No, I. OK. I, <laughs> okay. I'm aware. Well, All Sorry. right. So so go ahead, Jen. I was just trying to, to figure out if you're still if you want to go through what's before Let's that. Let's just first. keep going through before that. We'll get to that. OK. This is this will be a point of discussion when we after we've gone through the bill. Thank you. OK. Um, so we have the commission, its membership, its powers and duties and what it considers. <laughs> Um, there had been a change here from the chair taking out the language about looking at the efficacy of the all-payer model and instead looking at how alignment of Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance patient care management rules and guidelines affect access to and affordability of care, including access to referrals for extended care, counseling, and social services. So on this one, Cheryl, did you want to... Well, I was just going to say, are we going to come back to this and have a fuller discussion? A more if you would like to, that's what we'll do. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And then we have the new number five that I added based on your discussion yesterday. Um, so one of the things for the uh, commission to look at would be the findings and recommendations from previous studies and analyses relating to the affordability of healthcare coverage in Vermont. And Madam Chair, did you want to? We're good. We're flagging okay. that one. I Great. mean, this might be where this might be where the uh, previous studies and principles of healthcare reform as expressed in Act 48, and I would say other statutes. So if we could put that in there, that sort of fills out um, some of the work. Yeah, I think we may want to think about what you're looking to get yeah. from each of those items because yeah. this one, I think, pretty clearly directs people to particular documents that have already been created, whereas the other may be kind of the lens through which they are um, looking at all of these. Mm -hmm. Okay, items. that's a good point. Yeah, I think we should put it under the creation, and I have some wording if we want once we get back to that. Oh, right up in the yeah. Okay, there. Okay, we can yeah, certainly look at that. that. Sort of does what you just said. It's the lens through which they look at everything. 
Well, so if we're going to do that, uh, then I just want to uh, encourage us to look at also some of the principles around uh, what's going on in current healthcare reform with our care management process and uh, linking um, medical, men medical care, mental health care, social services. So that's a whole nother layer. Okay, so keep going, Jen. Okay. So that is, takes us, oh, there is one other thing. It's not in yours um, and I don't think it will affect much for you, but um, for as far as assistance, um, this consultant would actually be hired. Um, my understanding from JFO is that this should oh, be yeah. hired through the Office of Legislative Operations, not right. through the Joint Fiscal Office. So I have that in sort of my working updates. And version. that's not up for discussion. <laughs> Um, all right. So then we have um, the some of the pieces from Act 130 or S132 uh, that were added. So this is that section on um, requiring the ACOs to collect and analyze clinical data um, in order to determine the quality of care provided, implement targeted quality improvement measures and ensure proper care coordination and delivery across the continuum of care and provide the results of those analyses to the Green Mountain Care Board. And I see a hand from Senator Cummings. Go ahead, Senator. Uh, have we, I'm just thinking the, the concern about the overhead cost at the ACO. Do they have the staff and technical ability to analyze clinical data? Well, yes. Are they gonna hire an MD? I think they do have an MD uh, who it works with them and they are currently doing this, uh, this kind of work, but it's nowhere in uh, their char a charge to an ACO to do this. So any ACO would be responsible then for this clinical data analysis. I happen to know when we heard from the FQHCs, when they were interested in forming a, an ACO, they also brought in their uh, work that they're doing on adverse uh, childhood experiences or on social determinants. So there's, there's a lot of clinical data analysis. This is also consistent with blueprint and so on. Then we have the section that comes from S-132, Section 6. This gives the Office of the Auditor or the State Auditor access to the records of uh, an ACO. I want to, I, I, we need to have a discussion about this because as you read this, and it's something that um, I uh, am now very sensitive to, and that says any affiliated entity within it, um, that's one. But number two, well, we'll have a discussion afterwards, but we should understand that there's currently a lawsuit going on between the auditor and the ACO. And our legislative uh, rule, I think, has always been not to get in the middle of um, legal action. So I'm very concerned about keeping this, this in at this time among other things, so go ahead. Then we have a new section that I put in at the request of the chair um, based on some testimony that you heard the other day around pharmacy benefit managers and 340B entities. Um, so this is a, an entirely new section. Um, it would add to an existing statute on pharmacy benefit managers and required practices with respect to pharmacies would add on some specific 340B provisions in a new subsection D that says a pharmacy benefit manager shall not create any additional requirements or restrictions on a 340B entity on the basis of the entity's direct or indirect participation in the 340B drug discount program, uh, shall not require a claim for a drug to include a modifier to include that the drug, indicate that the drug is a 340B drug unless the claim uh, it should be is for payment directly or indirectly, make that fix here, um, by Medicaid 
or restrict access to a pharmacy network or adjust reimbursement rates based on a pharmacy's participation in a 340B contract pharmacy arrangement. Okay. Jen, do you, <laughs> I know we got a little testimony on that, but do you have more information on the sort of uh, context of this by any chance? Uh, we can talk about that later. I do also have context. So Jen, go ahead. Uh, I mean, I, I understand that there have there are um, certainly tensions between the work that the pharmacy benefit managers do and the the uh, incentives in the 340B drug discount program. Um, so this, I believe, is to address concerns from the pharmacy side um, about um, conditions that pharmacy benefit managers are imposing on them um, that are specific to their participation in the 340B program. Um, and I understand this language, uh, this language is similar to some that was um, Utah recently enacted in Utah. I did look at the Utah language, which is a little bit more extensive, um, which doesn't mean you need to make yours more extensive, but, um, but some of that may provide some of, a little bit of the context. Um, Madam Chair, I don't know if you have more background on that well, other than I, was, I think that's I just was the simply going concern. to say, yeah, at, at, at a very high level, the 340B uh, prescription drug program allows for reduced pricing for prescription drugs. And so patients get their prescription drugs at a, at a lower rate when it's in a 340B pharmacy. And FQHCs, of course, are part of this. And then there's some other others across the state. If a PBM then charges, uh, takes some of that money away from the 340B program. So the 340B program benefits the patient, but also the provider, the, the pharmacy that, that's providing the, the drug. In this case, it could be a FQHC. But if you take away that um, incentive for the pharmacy, then um, there, the, the, the pharmacy may not be able to pass savings on to the patient. So that's the-, the Right, so I'm, if I can clarify a little bit, the 340B sure. drug discount program is really about how the, the covered entity, the, the participating entity um, acquire, the cost at which they right. acquire the medication right. and the idea behind the federal program was uh, it's available, 340B participation is available to hospitals and FQHCs and certain other um, and facilities for their outpatient um, medication. So nothing that, that happens inpatient. And the idea was to allow the, those providers to retain that difference between what they acquire the medication for and what they get reimbursed by the insurer or other payer for as a way to, to um, help with their social missions and you know to their, their care of their patients. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily always get passed on to the uh, patient, but the, the savings is really supposed to accrue to the entity itself. And so when if the PBM is not reimbursing the pharmacy, the regular amount that they would be reimbursing the pharmacy, that kind of undermines that 340B incentive. Um, 340B program is, itself is, is um, fairly controversial at this point, and there are are uh, proponents and opponents of continuing it in its current form, both I think in the state and at the federal level. Okay, I mean I'm familiar with the 340B program. I right an organization that ha that used it, um, and that's fine, Jen. Your information is super helpful. I was just wondering what the problem is we're trying to fix. Like what is happening that this language came and we got a little information, but I I'm sorry, at this point in the session, we're getting so much information that I can't remember exactly what they said is happening. Um, it's that phar pharmacy benefit managers are imposing more restrictions and requirements and, and basically trying to damp down participation in the program. And so this is to try to prevent that. Is that essentially what your understanding is, Jen? I don't, I, I don't know the specific problem, I have to say, that, that is looking to be solved. I think the language came, I got more, more language than background. <laughs> yes. uh, there's, I did send an article out uh, that's on our webpage, and the, I, I believe Jessa Barnard uh, and 
uh, others testified on it the day before yesterday. And then yesterday there was testimony from Blue Cross and Blue Shield. I guess it would be my hope that the folks who are interested in this, who are out in the Zoom world could get together and come to some resolution of differences and, and help us understand how to, how to maintain the 340B program as it is now, um, because I do think that there is a benefit to patients. And so that's the, that's the concern that, that I would have. But just this is a request for folks who are in the, out there in the Zoom world to maybe connect with one another. We don't have a hallway for you to visit <laughs> because we're not in our committee room. Uh, if we were, I might suggest the, that you get together and try to resolve uh, some differences for us on this one. Okay. Okay. Section six is the uh, State Health Improvement Plan. So this came out of S-132 as well. And this has the Commissioner of Health rather than the Secretary of Human Services or designee being the one to adopt the State Health Improvement Plan that set, sets forth the health goals and values for the state. Um, and in the current and existing language, the it would be now be commissioner, not secretary, may amend the plan as um, that individual deems necessary and appropriate. And section seven here, which is a new section, would require the commissioner of health to submit copies of the current state health improvement plan by January 15th, along with any updates to the plan and a timeline for adoption of a new state health improvement plan. And that would come to this committee and your house counterpart committee. So really sort of looking at the existing duties, asking to see what there is now, but also what their plans are for the future. And Madam Chair, I know that this was your language and I'm wondering um, by changing it to the commissioner of health and, you know, I understand that makes some sense, but the, would that, there's no language to also include, for example, um, Diva or Dale or all the other <laughs> other subsections of the Agency of Human Services, which also are relevant to a health plan. And I think that's why the secretary was charged with it before, because the secretary is, oversees all of those divisions within the Agency of Human Services. Well, and the, but the, the plan goes outside of the agency um, and it looks to all the data that exists um, for people and organizations in the state. So then it would help inform where healthcare is accessible in the state ge geographically and would then inform the health resource allocation plan at the Green Mountain Care Board. That's the way it, 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 it's used. So <clears throat> the commissioner of health would have the knowledge and the to go out and can certainly connect with anyone uh, within the agency to do that. So um, it does seem more appropriate to have the commissioner of health in charge. I think it's a practical this. matter the commit the Department of Health, maybe I'm just looking at the plan itself, the, the current plan. And I think uh, it already comes from the, I think the designee here in practice has been the commissioner of health. Yep. Um, yep. So I'm not sure from a practical standpoint that this is uh, a change to the current practice, but it does make that, it does um, put that change into it, the statute. It puts a responsibility in place that I think is important and then we can, it will, it, it's been lagging, let's put it that way. Okay. It, Was that a thought, Senator Hooker? I didn't want to move on if you were no, going to say sad. something. Thanks. Okay. And we have additional reports. So this one in section eight is from S-132, and this is the one that would require the Green Mountain Care Board to report in January um, regarding the increases in health insurers, administrative expenses over the most recent five-year period, and compared with the increases in the consumer price index. Section nine, also from S-132, would have the ACOs 
um, provide by January 15th a description of their initiatives to connect primary care practices with social service providers, including the specific individuals or precision titles responsible for carrying out those care coordination efforts. Section 10 is the primary care visits without cost sharing uh, reports, also from S-132. Again, this would have um, by January 15th, DIVA in consultation with others report on the analysis of the likely impacts on qualified health plans. So that's the individual and small group plans, patients, providers, premiums, and population health of requiring the um, plans to provide each insured with at least pr two primary care visits per year with no cost sharing requirements. So DIVA does the one for the individual and small group market and the Green Mountain Care Board would do the same for the large group plans, including the plans for state employees and school employees of, again, that same um, two primary care visits per year with no cost sharing. And as Devin Green previewed a little bit in her, her testimony uh, to you the other day, one of the issues that always comes up in this area is the high deductible health plans and their eligibility for health savings account under federal law, which requires or, or only allows certain things to be covered without cost sharing. Um, and so that, that is often the hurdle here, but we'll see what the result comes back from these analyses. And then we have the effective dates um, had been taking effect on passage, but if you're doing that PBM language, it seemed to make sense to have that start on a date certain and apply to contracts entered into or renewed on or after that date between the PBM and the pharmacy. Um, that's similar to the approach that Utah had taken in theirs. Okay. All right. So we have some area, we have some things to discuss. So let's take the bill down and then we have the bill on our, um, we have it on our webpage on our iPads. So Jen, I think you're keeping track, I'm keeping track, everybody's keeping track <laughs> of what they'd like to go through. Uh, so the first one is what, findings or not? First one is, right, the first one is findings. Um, and so far we have uh, changed in finding number two, um, the timing of that financial estimate, that, that cost estimate for a family of four um, to, from being currently to in 2020, which thank you, Senator Hardy, that was an elegant solution. Good, good job. Okay, we're good with that one. What's next? Yes, and I may need to make a few conforming grammatical changes to put it in the past tense. Um, number three, the new number three is around the cost of um, prescription drugs. If there's any additional um, thoughts on those, on, on that? Uh, I mean, what well, you could say a lot on that one, but we'll just, that, that speaks for itself. And there definitely have been reports on that one. <laughs> yep. Um, all right, that was it for the findings, unless there are additional findings that people want to consider or propose. Okay, we're good. All right. Then we get into this commission task force committee, whatever you want it to be. Well, let's let's call it something now. We'll settle that one. I think commission committee, committee work 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 group what? Mm -hmm. I think committee or work group because a commission. I agree with Jen. Sounds like it's much longer and mm -hmm. in this sort of blue ribbon commission kind of thing that w goes over several years. This is around for six months basically, and it's. Do you want it to be a task force since it sort of has a mission or? Yeah, Ooh, that's good. I like task, task force, force is good. Okay. Yeah. I will change that throughout. Thank you. And then the sort of cross reference to the principles of healthcare reform. Mm -hmm. If you look them up, you can find them, everybody. Um, uh, there's a list of, and they're really really good and they include what you said senator Lyons. so they include a whole bunch of things there are 13 of them and oh, they're wow. more they're more like their principles and i would suggest putting them under creation um sort of something like and jen you'll have a better elegant way of putting this but something like 
in keeping with the principles of healthcare reform under 18 VSA 9371, there is created the, the, a task force on sort of making it the umbrella under which everything else is looked at. Um, so I'm not okay. sure if I would make the task force itself sort of consistent with that, because I'm not sure that, that it's the creation. I think it's real. I mean, if I understand what you're looking for them to do, you're really looking for them to apply these principles in their decision making consideration and, and decision. Right. So, so it, it doesn't seem like, it, I mean, maybe it would be a duty, but it's sort of like overarching their, their all their duties is it's a lens basically. Right. So I'm almost thinking at the, um, in the powers and duties at the beginning of that, um, my other, my, we, my, in, my, go ahead. No, okay. Finish your sentence. No, your I'm, I'm thinking out loud. So, so I don't need to do that. Uh, so, uh, I'm also thinking that as we developed uh, the the principles for the ACO, uh, which comes come after Act 48, and I know in Act 48 I was the one who suggested that healthcare is a public good, and we put it in, so, so it's there. Uh, but also the um, having some of the principles that are within the establishment of any ACO, I think, is also important. So. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not in favor of that. I like the broader, just sort of yeah. um, general well, let's healthcare care, reform. Before you, before, you, before you suggest they are not important, I would suggest I that we look at them uh, because they do call for some uh, continuity and consistency for our healthcare system. So to build a system that has continuity for patients who are moving from acute care to more chronic care and patients who are moving from a hospital setting, for example, to a substance use disorder counseling environment. So those kinds of things, the care management piece to me is important. So let's look, can we, Jen, pull up the principles uh, that um, Senator Hardy has identified and then maybe look at the principles that have been written since that time. I don't want to lose sight that work has been done after Act 48. I was very much engaged in Act 48, and I was also engaged in the others, and I know others here have been as well. Put these up. Oh, shoot. So here is, these are the um, what was enacted in Act uh, 48, but has also been amended over time um, in the statutes. These are the principles for healthcare reform. Senator Hardy, I think this is what you were referring to, the 18 BSA 9371. Yes. Um, and so it starts with that there, uh, the General Assembly adopts the following principles as a framework for reforming healthcare in Vermont. And then it goes through, as Senator Hardy said, I think 13. So no, 14, 14. Um, I don't know if you want me to walk through them or you just want them up. You're muted, Senator Lyons. Oh, I was gonna say, if you scroll down through them slowly, we'll be able okay. to see them. <laughs> Okay. 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 Uh, okay. Sounds good. I think it's fine. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. They look good. That seems to cover Let's just everything. use those. Yeah. We don't need to go any further, I think. Okay. That's good. Um, so I think we can put a reference to those. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking of it in the powers and duties kind of lead in. Um, Under paragraph C. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sort sense. That, that okay. Makes sense. Um, so I'm just going to, for the moment, I'm going to make a note that just says add, add, or add, yeah, we'll say Act 48 principles reference, but we don't really have to call it Act 48. Um, right. So, all right, I will look at how to incorporate that in there. Good. Senator Hooker, this is what you were talking about earlier this morning. It is, it is. Um, and I, I would prefer to have language in there regarding um, transparency and accountability uh, so that Vermonters understand the ACO and its effect on them. Uh, well, I think this is broad enough that it will capture any any entity within our healthcare system. Well, are you talking about the lead-in, Senator Lyons? Yeah. Are you talking about the lead-in language or the number two? I think Senator. The lead-in. I'm talking Senator about the lead-in. Maybe on to C two. Oh, is that where you are, Senator moved Hooker? Moved on, Senator Hooker. I'm on. I'm on two. Okay. Where the yeah we have crossed out. Um, the language regarding efficacy of the all payer uh, of the all payer accountable care organization model, but um, I would like to see it replaced with some reference to um, helping Vermonters understand what the ACO is and its effect on them. Um, but so, if you think, uh, if you think that, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Senator. no, go ahead. Go no, ahead. I was going to say. With the reference to um, the principles of healthcare, um, that might help cover some of this, since you know it talks about having the committee look at transparency and accountability. So, um, but if there's a way to incorporate that, just so this committee can allow Vermonters to understand the process and how it's affecting them, including how it affects them when they're being discharged from the hospital and that continuity of care. I'm not sure that Vermonters really understand what the ACO is, but, you know. So I guess my question is this, is, the, is this committee gonna go out and present information to people and if, this committee is going to do that we should say something up front about that as a charge and then the committee itself should based on prior uh, reports and reform efforts structure what the committee would like to present so i i, I don't think that having the committee analyze the aco is something that this committee can do nor the it will take the consultant all of his or her time or their time uh so and thinking about this um uh, that's all i want to say at this point senator lines i agree i don't think the committee has sufficient staffing or time or expertise to evaluate the aco i i completely agree with that one of the things that we heard testimony on though was that um uh, it's potentially a good opportunity to find out what Vermonters um, understand about our healthcare system broadly, including the ACO and how it impacts their care. And so I think that that might be a good charge given that this committee is supposed to be going out around the state or task force now. Now it's a task force. <laughs> um. So I, you know, what you're saying is important, but I do think that the um, the work of the committee and the listening tour that's going to go on will allow for people to make comments. It, it, uh, you're 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 uh, you're right. They will. They already have. And there's a strong group. There's a there's a large group of people who um, 
really dislike the ACO. And I don't know why. And uh, there, there may be some, some underlying reasons for that, but as some of it is related to um, understanding and some of it might be related to actual um, what, what's happening. But you're going, we're going to hear that as people go around the state, that's going to be expressed. So the question is, is it the job of this committee to go out and explain everything up front before taking uh, testimony? So that, that's, a, that's a discussion probably that the committee is going to have to have as it convenes itself. Uh, I don't see the language related to the ACO statute because there could be any ACO. It's not, you know, if you're, if you're concerned about one care, then people are gonna tell you you're concerned about one care. For me, this task force is looking at insurance costs, out of pocket cost, cost of care, access, of, uh, access to care on the ground, boots on the ground for people. That's a very different um, look than what is going on and the review that the CMMI is making around the One Care ACO five-year uh, program. So it's, right, it's I, I agree. Different animals. <laughs> I agree, I agree, Senator Lyons, and I said that. And, and so uh, what I'm suggesting is in the language that you suggested, the how alignment of Medicare, that we just include how Vermont's all payer accountable care organization model and alignment of Medicare, Medicaid, Medicaid, Medicare, and private insurance, patient care model, blah, 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 and then the rest. So that it's I just- the, I, 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 will not, I, I won't entertain that. I just don't think it's something we want. You just don't want it mentioned at all? Nope. Why not? That's part of our health care system. It's, it's two different things. What you're looking at when you talk about alignment, private insurance, patient care management, rules and guidelines, you're talking about very specific things about uh, cost and transparency. When you look at an ACO, you are looking, we're, we're thinking about uh, an organization that's building clinical data for clinical improvement and for uh, building a, a a system over time. It isn't the immediate return that we're going to see with this. And I don't think, you know, if, uh, I think as the committee forms itself and discusses this, it may well be that um, the committee wants to present information and ask questions about any type of organization that's out there, whether it's an FQHC, a hospital, uh, a rural clinic, uh, a free clinic. So all of those things are things that the, um, that the uh, task force can look at and listen about. So why don't we list that then? Uh, that would be a long list. <laughs> I, I mean, I just, I, you know. I the... think we want to hear from people what they're experiencing and their day-to-day -day care, the money that they're paying for their premiums, what it's costing them, uh, how they can see improvement when they're discharged from a hospital, how they can see improvement when uh, they, their limit on counseling services and all of those things are so key and important to people right now. That, that, that's what I want to know. I want to know what, what are the glitches in the system that are keeping people from accessing care, whether it's cost or whether it's uh, some clinic that's 100 miles away and you have to get to two, three times a week. Well, I certainly don't want to keep people from expressing themselves and, and from learning from these listening sessions what Vermonters are feeling. Um, my concern was that, you know, we have this system in place. This is the one that we're using and people don't know what it is. And it was, you know, a simple helping people to understand 
how the system is being run. But uh, certainly I don't want it to keep this bill from going forward. So, you know, we can move on. I mean, there is language that Jessica Barnard uh, suggested for this uh, also. Maybe you want to look at that. I think with the language, I looked at Jess's language and, and the language that's in there that you suggested is, the, the language isn't accessible to average Vermonters. And so that's yeah. why, you know, talking about like, how does the, the system impact their care, which is what you just said. Um, I, I mean, you know, maybe we just say that, how does the overall system, including blah, 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 impact the care of your care as Vermonters. Define and, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> well, I mean, hospitals, um, the accountable care organization, clinics, um, medical practices, and we, add, you know, we list the things that are part of the system, insurance companies, all of those things, and, and, and see what people have to say. And why don't we do it this way? Why don't we say um, the accessibility of care through through the system uh, at, through public and private insurance and hospitals clinics and other care facilities because there's a that we could have a list a mile long and I'm not um, and I, I do think there's a distinct difference between what you're talking about when you say ACO and what a, a clinic is very different well so this is the charge of the committee to consider yeah. the effects of this system including a few <laughs> that we could list um well, including it means that there are many others so sure. it's not just the ones that are listed okay and the effect that they have on vermont's on vermonters and, and their health care yeah, I mean, it's the, yeah. Okay, all right. So it's the public and private insurance. It's uh, access to uh, physicians and other pr providers, ac access and uh, care coordination. So there's a whole lot in there. Okay. Senator Cummings has a question. Yeah, Senator Cummings. Yeah, I... I don't think we can tell Vermonters what they can talk about. Exactly. I mean, if we're going out there and they have concerns, they can talk about them. You can't. I mean, I've had the experience of telling the nuclear physicist that I'm sorry, you can't talk about safety at Vermont Yankee. Um, I, I have to let them talk. I got in trouble for that, but they're members of the public and they have a right to be heard. Why can't we just say how Vermont how the Vermont healthcare system affects system people. is impacting their their lives? I'm with you on that. That's that that is what the I. The ACO I is part of the healthcare system. If they come, I don't on think, it. I think you've got advocacy groups that love it or hate it. I don't know anybody loves it. I doubt that the average Vermonter has any idea what it is, how it works, and they aren't focused on it. They're focused on how come when I was going and paying $99 for the physical therapist and suddenly it cost $300. That's well, we figured out why. Um, those are the things that are impacting people. So, so Senator, it, 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 if, if I'm hearing you right, and I completely agree, we, we should, Vermonters should be coming in and saying exactly what's on their mind about the healthcare system and how it affects them, period. So maybe we just say that, how the system, how the healthcare system is affecting them, period, uh, or something similar, a number two. Their lives and their access to health care. Yeah, I like that. Okay. And the cost. And the cost. Yeah, access and cost. Access and cost. 
Well, cost definitely affects access. Yeah, so the, the, the one here says uh, access and affordability um, of care. And then what about, the, what about the phrase at the end of that, including access to referrals for extended care, counseling and social services? Do you wanna include that or just forget it? Well, I think that, that that speaks to your continuity of care and you know what happens in the long term as opposed to what's happening acutely, doesn't it? Yeah, that was the point. Okay. All right. So, so I need a little guidance now on what you have decided. Um, that the note I wrote that it sounded like you're all coalescing around for a moment there was how the healthcare system is affecting the lives of Vermonters. And then you added and their access to healthcare, and then you added and costs, and and then you're taking a piece of what the language is. So, what what do you want? How broad Does or narrow? Does it make sense do you want to that? you, Senator <laughs> Cummings? It's all. It's, it's so. Do you want to? <laughs> Try to clarify. You had an idea. No. Um, I think what we want to know is how the present Vermont's present health care system is impacting their lives. That mm -hmm. positively, negatively, about how it's impacting their lives. Um, and then I guess you get to the subsets including accessibility or availability, cost, um, imposed limitations. What about the going there, accessibility, uh, affordability, which is cost, and then do you, do you think we should, adding the phrase that's already there, that including access to referrals for extended care, counseling, and social services? Did that you want that 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 suggests continuity of care? I mean, given some of my recent experience, I am starting to question whether always doing the lower priced or cost option like physical therapy, and you know, before you go to take a picture of anything, I've had. Several people I know had very bad experiences with that. Yep. Um, at what point do you go to the more expensive option? That's well, we're going to hear that. I mean, that. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's the kind that of people are going to share. Yeah. I guess the question are they is allowed. Yeah. So yeah. what what are you allowed to access? Go ahead, Senator Hardy. <laughs> Um, I, I like Anne's language. Let's just keep it simple and just say how the, you stated it and a uh, center coming, sorry, how the healthcare system is impacting the lives of Vermonters, just period. And then if we start to list things, then we argue over the list. So let's just not list anything. <laughs> and that leaves it the, Yeah, it is impacting their lives, their access to healthcare. Their lives and their and the and their access to health care. And could I just um, ask that we say all Vermonters and Vermont businesses? I think we referred to that. Yes. Obviously. Good point. We may take some of the edge off if we get S eighty eight moving, but what's S eighty eight? Oh, that's the separate. It, it, well, it's the insurance housekeeping <laughs> bill, but now it's Thank got the healthcare the market separation. Oh, I got gotcha. you, Dr. Hardy. We we've got it. <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm sorry. planning to get it out today. Oh, really? So uh, we should talk because okay, you guys recording. can talk later. <laughs> all right, another another topic. All right, another okay, topic. Are we all set with this? Then? So, so well, what you've landed on, I think, is how Vermont's current healthcare system is impacting Vermonters and Vermont businesses and their access to healthcare. And I would say all Vermonters. Costs and access. <laughs> no, we want we do, we want access and affordability, both, or not. Up to the committee. I'm sorry. I'm just I'm, so I'm tired sorry. and I'm, I'm losing it. I'm so tired. Poor Jen. I surrender. <laughs> All right. Access, not not cost. Access and affordability. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. Yes. Okay. Please. So you want to know how how Vermont's current healthcare system is impacting Vermonters and Vermont businesses. Ah, how about access to quality health care? Cost effective. Uh, well, ex cost is affordable. No. Cost affects access. If you can't afford it, you can't access it. Okay. Affordable. Okay. So, and their access to affordable health care? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. That's good. Okay. Again, so, Senator Hooker, I heard you on the all, but I think it's, um, I don't know. So, how Vermont's current health care system is impacting all Vermonters sounds like you need a, a broader. macro and not, and you're not interested in, in, individuals oh, okay. all right I'm, no. so i we're mean gonna, if that's... we're going to listen to all yeah, vermont to everybody but okay. yeah if you don't okay think so be all is necessary that's fine i think huh? if you're if the task force is supposed to consider how the system is impacting vermonters and vermont businesses it includes it it includes, it includes everybody i mean that's not it's not you're not identifying segments of the state okay talk about can we talk about individual that's what i was just thinking individual vermonters oh, yes. yeah and vermont business and i'm yes. not even sure about vermont I, I if we say vermonters are we leaving out illegal we aren't saying illegal immigrants people no. aren't supposed to be here. Residents. i mean i think they're right i think wait, you're, the residents okay residents. right i mean we could say vermont res individual vermont residents and vermont businesses or impacting Vermont I don't think residents we have to have Vermont, Vermont twice. I mean, Vermont residents, residents and businesses. Yeah. See, this is why we should have stopped with the short phrase that Anne suggested. <laughs> Never that I'm easy. Not in this discussion. <laughs> this is sausage making at the at its finest. Yes, it's beautiful. I can only imagine what the live transcript sounds like. <laughs> Josh, are you we will read, read it? it at the next. <laughs> I'm, I'm is, here. I'm here. This Ruth. will be the last time. This will be the last time that health and welfare is selected <laughs> to be the committee of experimentation with closed captions. So, so I do also want to note you do have Katie here, and I know she has a, a smaller window of availability. So maybe I will go off and look at what you've done so far for a few minutes. Okay. If you want to talk I, to her. I just want to reiterate my concern about having that section in on the audit piece and because I do feel very strongly about not getting involved in the middle of uh, a, a, a legal action. I think that's generally a good principle. Yeah, I do. Okay. It's I'm in fine. court. I'm fine with that. I'm right, we do that. actually, there's actually a statute about ongoing court proceedings. We would, it occurs to me probably need to not withstand if you wanted to do that. So, uh, so you're thinking just take it out. No, I understand, it, yeah, I understand. Yeah, just okay. take it out. We also got a couple emails from folks about good. the three forty B thing, which we can look at um, if we want. Yeah, we'll um, pick that. Let's pick that one up later. But you're right. Let's pick that one up later. But well, we do need to look at it. Okay. Well, I will work on these. What you've done so far in this, I'll just be on. Okay. Is Katie is here? There she is. Okay. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Nice to see everyone. Uh, you've come. You've you've come and saved us. From ourselves, I, and just just to let you know, that's what Katie, staff usually does. I think, <laughs> Katie, the um, today we are a part of the IT's work to add closed captioning to our committee. So our committee is anything that we say is put into closed caption on Zoom and on YouTube doesn't guarantee that it's going to be a direct translation or effect or, you know so but i just to let you know that's happening okay great thank you so go ahead um we are on the agenda with you what do you want to take up first uh because it i know you have something to say on both of those bills it, it's up to you um i have both pulled up ready to go so okay uh let's which which would you think is less time consuming 46 oh, I, I, they're both pretty brief let's then let's go to 210 okay disparities bill 
Uh, see, it only it's only going to 10. So you've got a whole lot of people out there scrambling for 10 in the closed captioning. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So are you seeing draft 3.2 on your screens? Yes, we are. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I kept the highlighted changes from yesterday, thinking that you might want to just take a look at those again. And I've also highlighted the changes you've made since yesterday. So I'll walk you through those. The first section is findings. Yesterday there was not findings, but um, there was a change added overnight. Mm -hmm. So I will scroll down to um, provide you that language. Um, so there is a new subdivision 10 and then um, an amended subdivision um, 11, um, which previously was 10. So the new subdivision 10, the, the committee heard testimony that there should be findings um, about um, Native American populations, particular, particularly individuals um, living in Vermont. Um, so the first um, finding has to do with national data. And then the second one is more specific to Vermont. So um, in this subdivision 10, according to the Indian Health Service, the American Indian and Alaska Native people have long experienced lower health status when compared with other Americans, including a life expectancy among American Indian and Alaska Native people born today that is 5.5 years less than the US all races population. And then the second um, change, um, there's language borrowed um, from the, the House resolution that passed on eugenics. Um, and there's a direct quote there, and I will go through that with you. And then there's also a reference that was in the bill that came over to you from the House of the state's 1931 sterilization law. So that um, reference has been retained. So this new language is out as outlined in the House's resolution, Vermont state sanctioned eugenics policies targeted Vermonters of Native American Indian heritage, including French Indian and Abenaki families and persons of mixed ethnicity and of French Canadian heritage, as well as the poor and persons with disabilities among others. These policies, including the state's 1931 sterilization law, are examples of past injustices in the healthcare system that continue to impact members of these communities in the present day. That's terrific. Thank you. So, Madam yeah, the closed caption said e Evan Nike, as in sneakers. Uh oh. <laughs> oh my. Um, uh -oh. Madam Chair. So, Evan very... Nike's family is being. <laughs> um, Go ahead. Uh, so Katie and I went back and forth last night till pretty late <laughs> to get these two. Um, and um, the uh, one of the, the reasons why she has the national data is it's really hard to have to find specific health data yeah. for um, Native um, Americans in Vermont. And that's sort of part of the point of the bill is with all the work on the data. Um, and um, in looking at the, the finding that we had in there before the previous number 10, it did make a reference to the eugenics um, movement. And in looking at the house resolution, it seemed like their language, which has already passed the full house, I think unanimously or almost, um, was really specific and based on a lot of research that they had done. So that's why we thought that sort of quoting it directly was really helpful. Yes, that's excellent. That's very good. And I, I'll say that um, when I taught genetics, culture, and society and went through and tried to find the same type of data, it's not, it's not easily found. There, are some there is some archival material, but that maybe our archivists could look find for us someday. But this really, I think, is excellent. It's good. Good job. OK, let's vote. OK. So the next section was the legislative intent and purpose section. And we have lead in language to this end. The General Assembly believes that. And then there's language we looked at yesterday. Um, so I, I'm trying to remember if there is a change since yesterday. Um, but this is the language about, oh, there was a change. We added a cross-reference. Um, this is the language about um, the challenge of coming up with a proper um, categories and definitions. 
and how this bill continues to, to kind of shine a light on that difficulty and also try to move um, towards um, working on this issue and the terms we use um, in 18 VSA chapter six, the new chapter that this bill creates. So the language reads that definitions of racial categories and identities can be difficult to agree upon as they often create hierarchies and comparisons that center whiteness, prioritize one group or identity over another and fail to recognize historical inequities and oppression. Definitions also shift over time as broader cultural norms change. While potentially problematic, in order to align with data collection standards and create consistency, this bill does, does use the term non-white as defined um, later on in the bill, and also seeks to create new definitions that better reflect racial and ethnic identities and categories pursuant to section six of this act. And section six is the new language that was added, um, or excuse me, this cross-reference is the new language that was added and that references the study that we looked at yesterday in section six that has um, this look at um, terms and categories as part of the first year report back for the advisory commission. So I will move past this and then we get into the new chapter itself, chapter six. We start off um, with a definition section. A previous version that you looked at um, had language um, that cultural competency means um, acquiring cultural humility and a set of integrated attitudes. That incorporation here has been removed in um, favor of adding a standalone definition of cultural humility, um, meaning the ability to maintain an interpersonal stance that is other oriented or open to the other in relation to aspects of cultural identity that are most important to the client or patient. And then the rest of this section has of course been renumbered to reflect the new definition. Hey, Katie, um, mm -hmm. just so that I know that Senator Lyons knows this, but that definition came from um, Dr. Coleman at UVM Health Center. Um, and based on her testimony, the chair had reached out to her about the language and that's what she suggested. Good, thank you. I was going to say that, and you, that, I'm happy you said it. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> Great. No, I think, you know, Dr. Coleman, I think, is going to be very important as we move forward in the area of health disparities. I think she'll be a, an excellent resource for us um, in the future, now and in the future. I was, I was almost tempted to suggest her on the working group, but I don't, I don't, on the advisory group, but I think it probably doesn't make sense at this point. Sorry, Katie, go ahead. Okay, I'll keep moving. Um, the next section has to do with um, establishing the advisory commission and changes here include to the membership. Um, so as we talked about yesterday, adding the chief prevention officer or designee. And then the committee also asked to incorporate a member appointed by the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. So that person has been added. And then um, I noted as I went through the bill last night that we have um, staggered terms um, for the, the start date. For example, some of the members um, have a one-year term to begin with, others have a two-year term, and then others have a three-year term. Um, so because we have um, at my count 29 members, um, not including the uh, large members who have an automatic one-year term. Uh, I had to update all my numbering. So now I have um, 10 folks starting for a one-year term, 10 for a two-year term, and nine for um, a term of three years. So trying to get that math to work out to make sure the, the staggered terms will work. Good catch. Uh, this, is, this is really good. I mean, I think about the the uh, times being on a board and then trying to figure out membership and length of term and who's turning over when and how and uh, thank you for doing that. And then um, powers and duties we talked about um, yesterday there was a quite a bit of committee discussion as to whether to provide a date certain on when the office of the health equity um, 
would be up and running and what the correct date would be. The committee landed on not later than January 1, 2023. Um, so that's not a change from yesterday, but it's still reflected in the language. Again, not a change from yesterday, but one of the tasks of the advisory commission is to advise the Department of Health on any funding decisions um, relating to eliminating health disparities and promoting health equity and language and the General Assembly has been added. So the advice goes not only to the Department of Health, but it also comes into the General Assembly. Um, then in section, subsection, subdivision seven, um, there's language about advising the General Assembly on ever, efforts to improve cultural competency, um, cultural humility and anti-racism. The, the draft yesterday only referred to humility and um, because we updated the definition, I've reflected the, the change there to, to mirror the language and the definition. Next. Um, okay, so I'm moving to the, the studies and at the end, um, or report backs, I shouldn't call them studies, report backs at the end of the bill. So again, we have kind of the same change that we just looked at. Um, instead of referring to cultural competency and humility, um, I'm using the full term cultural humility to reflect what is in the definition section of the bill. And then this section six has had some changes. So if you remember, the bill that came over from the House had a report back that would be part of the Advisory Commission's first annual report. And it specified specific items that were to be part of the first annual report. Um, so the, the only item listed on the version that came from the House was budget recommendations for continuation of its work in fiscal year 2023 if the advisory commission deemed it was necessary. And the committee yesterday chose to add and for the funding of the Office of the Health Equity itself. And that um, is kind of a counterpart with the decision to provide a date certain by which the office is funded. Um, also, the, the committee discussed yesterday um, language about using the appropriate terminology and the appropriate categories when collecting data. Um, so yesterday, the committee only had this language in subdivision A, although it wasn't labeled as subdivision A yesterday, um, regarding appropriate and inclusive terms to replace non-white. And yesterday, you chose to add the language in B, which has to do with um, data ca uh, categories um, beyond white and non-white. And the committee chose to add a cross-reference to the language that is in the new chapter that um, talks about the uh, advisory commission uh, along with the executive director of racial equity to really focus and, uh, on this work. So um, this isn't changing that requirement. This is just giving a date certain by which the General Assembly hopes to have information from the advisory commission on that work. And then the, um, this report would also include um, seeking recommendations from the advisory commission on for most effective use of funding that's received by the state through ARPA in a manner that promotes um, health and achieves health equity by eliminating avoidable and unjust disparities in health on the basis of race, ethnicity, disability, or LGBTQ status. And that is it for changes. That's a lot of work in a short time. And thank you for a very clear explanation, Katie, really terrific. Thank you very much. Um, so just a question that I have for you. Uh, we, and Nolan is here and I'm wondering, Nolan, do we have a, a fiscal note on, remind me, on um, 210? There, obviously there's a, an advisory committee, but I think most of those folks are already compensated through their work or yeah, so for the record, Nolan Langwell, the Joint Fiscal Office, um, there was a fiscal note for this as passed the House. The House um, put the money for this in the budget. It was 180,000. That 180,000 would be to cover per diems and whatever else was needed. So uh, assuming that it's still in the budget on the Senate side, um, the fiscal note will just say, will, will not change much except for minor language changes. Okay, that's good to know. 
I, we, I think we did see that early on. And then um, the, the other question I have is from your experience, um, Katie and Nolan, will this then, this will go, will it go by rule 31 to approves? I'll do the furry Katie on that one. Um, I think that would be a question for, for Secretary, Secretary Bloomer. Um, I'm, I'm okay. trying to think if the if appropriations would have an interest in the language about recommendations, but um, I, I, I would defer to Secretary Bloomer. Okay, well, we'll see what happens with that. That's actually an important question because at the very end where it talks about ARPA funds, uh, the Appropriations Committee has been, is I think a little bit sensitive and probably justifiably so about any suggestions for use of ARPA funds, although this is just guidelines and criteria. I would say a bare minimum, you should let them know that the money on the house side for this was in the budget. So that we ha we did that in, in our budget um, memo. It's Got one it. of the, remember the bills listed right in the beginning and this is right there with it. Yeah, and I heard they love our budget memo. <laughs> <laughs> yep it's thorough um the other thing i will just flag is um the the language around data responsiveness um the money for that was actually in h315 act 9 so that's already law so the but that's actually that section's already been funded which section is that data? the stuff, the stuff oh, around okay. data oh at the end yeah yeah okay well, thank you. That's good. All right. Okay. Uh, committee discussion on the bill. Senator Terenzini. Yeah, all set, Senator Lyons. Let's uh, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's awesome. I love it. Anybody else disagree with that? No, I just want to thank Katie for all the work she's put in in the last couple of days. There's been a lot of back and forth and a lot to keep up with. And Katie, you've just done a fantastic job. So thank you so much. Ditto. Okay. All right. So uh, seeing no further discussion on the bill proposal before us, I would entertain a motion from somebody on draft 3.2 as amended. This is a strike all amendment. Is that right, Katie? Okay. I move that the committee approve draft 3.2 of H210. Okay. Uh, committee discussion. All right, Senator Terenzini, please um, take the vote, please. All right, thank you. Um, Myself, Senator Terenzini, yes. Senator Hooker? Yes. Senator Cummings? Got to get closer to your mic, Ann. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, <Porter Senator>. Ridge. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Hardy? Yes. Senator Lyons? Yes. I have five uh, yeses, zero, zero. Excellent. Excellent. Reporter, um, uh, so I, I, I just have this inkling that Senator Hardy would like to report this. And uh, it is a, a critically important bill for the committee. So Senator, after you report, it won't be, uh, please um, understand that I may stand up and say a few words. So it is of an course. important. Yes, I would love to report it. Thank you. Good. All right. Good, good. You've done a lot of work on it. Katie, will you send me the clean draft? Thank you. And yeah, then that if, that if that gets up to the secretary's office today, then it'll be on notice on Tuesday. Then we'll have two bills up on Wednesday. We're gonna have, unless it goes to a probe. So I don't know what uh, will happen there. We'll have to find out. Okay, let's move on to uh, H46, Katie. document for you. Okay, um, I assume you're seeing draft 1.1. 1. 1. 
Uh -huh. This is an amendment to H46, which is the bill on miscellaneous mental health provisions that we looked at yesterday. And a suggestion was made to um, amend section one to get rid of the um, phrase he or she and use more gender neutral language. So that was required in two different places and that change has been made by striking out all of section one, um, having a new section one here and the change is on line 11 and 12. Um, before the person may be admitted as a voluntary patient, the person shall give consent in writing on a form adopted by the department. And then similarly in subdivision one on line 14, striking his or her, the person understands that treatment will involve inpatient status. And the other um, corrections had already been in the bill. So that is it for this amendment. Okay. Uh, questions? I think that cleans up the language nicely. It's a good catch. So committee, questions, discussion? So section two remains the same. I'm trying to remember how many sections are in the bill in total. There were, well, five sections with five the effective sections. date, but four substantive sections and everything else would remain the same with this amendment. Okay. All right. Discussion, questions? Hearing none, I would accept a motion. Someone? So moved. All right, Senator Taranzini has moved. Draft 1.1 proposal of amendment for H46. So that was a motion for the amendment, was it not, Senator? Correct. Okay, discussion. All right. Please call the vote. Okay, Senator Terenzini, yes. Senator Hooker. Yes. Senator Cummings. Senator, Sen you're muted. Sorry, saying hi to the grandkids when they came in, yes. Good, okay. Senator Hardy. Yes. Senator Lyons. Yes. Five zero zero on the amendment. All right, now a motion uh, can be made on the bill as amended for H46 and to send to the full Senate. So moved. Discussion? Hearing none, uh, Senator Terenzini, please call the vote. Senator Terenzini will be yes. Senator um, Hooker. Yes. Senator Cummings. Closer to the mic, Dan. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a quarter of an inch, literally. Uh, S Senator um, Hardy. Yes. And Senator Lyons. Yes. Five right. zero zero. So uh, 46 on mental health, is there someone who would like to report this bill? Senator Cummings, are you open to reporting a bill or are you overwhelmed with other bills? I prefer not to, I've got okay. just a uh, lot I'm balancing. If, if no one else will do it, I guess I'll, I'll do it. And um, is there someone else, Senator Hooker or? I could do it if you'd like. Sure, okay, that'd be good. All right, thank you. Um, Katie, what other bills do you have for us? At That's all I have this morning. All right, so this is great. Um, thank you for all of your hard work these last few days and weeks. Um, thank you. So um, that, the, and then, so the clean copies of everything need to be gotten. So uh, 46 to Senator Hooker and 210 to Senator Hardy. And then you, oh, and then the other thing, I think uh, while you're here, I would ask for um, section by section of H171 as amended. And, and while you're here also, we might share uh, with folks that uh, H171 was in appropriations yesterday they took all of the money out. They modified 
Katie, was it, uh, they modified a number of the sections that had uh, money in it. And I'm trying to remember, I haven't looked at their uh, amendment today, but maybe you could help. Did they take section 10 and 11 out completely? Um, so section 10 is still in, but it is now just um, a report back on how the money was spent instead of a working group with recommendations on how to spend the money. And section 11 was taken out um, with the caveat that language would be added to the budget that would have um, DCF come up with a plan for the expenditure of the child care stabilization funds. Um, that plan would go to the chairs of the two subject matter committees and that the chairs um, upon their approval would refer the bill to joint fiscal committee for consideration okay, or not the bill, the, the plan. Yeah, the plan. That's not too different from what we had, but it's okay. Wait, okay. can I ask? Section 10 was that the whole working group thing was just removed? Yeah, so section 10 and 11 both had a working group and the working group concept has been removed from both. Although section seven, not seven, section 11 still directs DCF to consult with stakeholders. And they, in this, I'm sorry, I'm, the, they would still, it would still go through joint fiscal? For section 11, yes. For section, section 11, 11 not, but not, section 10 was the money that has to get out the door a little, I think, which one was quicker? 10 or 11. Now I'm what I was to told originally from by DCF was that section 11 had to get out the door okay. faster. Right, which is why we did put in some, we did put some guidelines in and criteria. So it's a little bit of a concern, but we'll see what happens with that. Then if I recall section 13, the education system analysis was also taken out of the bill. I can't remember if that was put in the budget. It says here in the amendments, Section 13. That's only subsection D, that's the money. Oh. Yeah, that's the money. Okay. Yeah, they, they actually, actually it was, there was, I'm not unhappy with what, uh, how the bill has come out. It's really mostly the money. So we actually do have a bill left, which is different from what has happened sometimes in the past. So we do still have a bill to report. Remember the last time we did this, uh, I was a reporter of the bill and never had an opportunity to speak to it on the floor because it was right. They put the whole, budget. all the language into the budget too, oh, right? Yeah. yeah. Right. That, you know, I, I think when a committee does its work, we ought to be able to express what some, some of the policy. Okay. So we're finished with that. It, you know, Jen is, uh, Katie, thank you. Nolan, thank you. <laughs> I don't know how many times to say it. Um, so Jenna is going to be coming back with with uh, 4:30 and 120. I think that we deserve just a couple minutes of break. So Jen, with due respect, let's come back in five minutes.